Oh, no, he's in the back. Uh, as you might have noticed, there's a camera in the back. And, uh, no sorry? No sound. Yeah, the sound will come up soon. He's, he's going upstairs. Um, he's only filming me, so he's not filming you. But then again, this whole session is about openness, so who minds? I thought I might as well put no publicity on my presentation because then a lot of people come in, right? Because everybody's now sitting next door with black shades. Well, too bad. But still, I'm happy uh, you're here. So you can hear me now, right? Okay, thank you very much. Um, some of you might recognize me from downstairs. I'm the talk show host who gets uh, people all day. We chat, do it on video. That's my job. Um, but I used to do other stuff. I used to be a researcher in the Information Society at uh, the Dutch Office of Technology Assessment, called the Rathenau Institute. So we, we write a lot of books about information technology in society. These are a couple of I worked on. Uh, the Internet of Things, privacy stuff, kids on the Internet, things where it goes well, things where it goes bad. Um, so two years ago I became a talk show host, but then it starts to itch. You know, you want to go back in this closet and do research, interview people, see how it works. So then, at the conference last year, there was a huge debate about responsible disclosure, because this guideline came out, right? And then I thought, well, I'm going to write a book about this, what actually happens. My background is both in electrical engineering and sociology. So what I do is I analyze both the human and the electronic networks. And responsible disclosure seemed to me a very good topic. So how do you find the publisher on that? Uh, how do you find a good editor? How do you find an audience? Well, I've done that before, and I have to say, it's boring. I don't like it. And I earn enough money to being a talk show host, so, so I thought, well, I'll just do it by myself. You know, why do, do I need these publishers? They only ask money from you. They do copyright, and copyright doesn't go inside with responsible disclosure. So what I did was I just started on my own. Doing research, interviewing a lot of guys like you guys here, fun guys. And the only thing I needed was an editor, because you make mistakes, right? Then I collaborated with uh, Platform Informatie Beveiliging, the platform for information security. They have this magazine, it's called Information Security. Uh, Lex Borger, sitting over there. And we made a deal. Every time I've done a case study, I write a column for their magazine, for free. And in return, they do the editing for me. And what's better, the column is also on the Creative Commons, so I can put it on the internet. And I get responses from the hackers, from the community, from the government, from other investigators. Very interesting. That's what I like about Creative Commons. So there are already eight case studies on my website. And there's a couple of more to come. So I re-edit it and the book will come out this uh, last year. Um, then, well, if you go out with your information, you meet interesting people. These are hacker strip. They make comics of hackers. They're good drawers, beautiful comics, but they needed stories. So I'm possibly going to collaborate with these guys to make these stories on responsible disclosure into a comic. And I know a lot of you hackers are dyslectic, but they like pictures. So there's probably a way to reach you guys. OK. So this is how the story goes. Um, this is the ideal world most people think internet is. You know? Happy users on one side. You have a screen, all sorts of services, and behind there we have a responsible manager, a technician who exactly knows where everything is, and if anything goes wrong, we always have the help desk, the nice ladies who solve all your problems. This is the ideal world. In a slightly less ideal world, this happens. There's a smart guy who finds a vulnerability in their website, and he turns the screen on the manager. But this is the slightly less ideal world, so they have a responsible disclosure policy. So the manager will tell him, well, this is our policy. You can do it. Uh, we have an online form to report. We have capacity to act. We send you confirmation. We negotiate the publication date. Report on progress. We inform the community. We decline from legal action, which is very important for these guys. And in the end, we give you the credits. A money, white hat, or a t-shirt. So the hacker, teaming up as a red team, of course, you recognize the colors, promises he shouldn't do some other things. Um, he will do no harm. Uh, he won't report to others. 
he won't social engineer or brute force. Well, this is actually under debate. If social engineering brute forcing is very easy to do, I think it's a responsible disclosure too, but let's not go into that debate again. Um, he wouldn't build, build backdoors. He won't copy, modify, delete, or share data, and he will not change the system. Again, this is the slightly less ideal world. So just read the manual, right? Then everything goes well. This is reality. There's not a website. There's actually a whole bunch of devices, a whole bunch of software, a whole bunch of stuff, services, clung together somewhere in time, and you don't know where the problem is. The people who find the vulnerability sometimes do it by accident. You know, you click on something, you, you instead of put text, some, some code in, and something comes out, you think, well, this isn't possible, you know. There are also hackers who think they have a very severe problem, keep on pushing the organization, well, it's not that big, you know, we don't have time for this kind of stuff. And there are a lot of hackers who would like to remain anonymous because, well, they fear that they are being caught and you don't want to meet their friends, right? From the side of the organization, normally this happens. People panic, they become mad. No, we already have so much stuff going on because the system administrator is totally overworked and now you're bugging us with this problem? And they always like to do it in the weekend, right? Because that's when these hackers work and no, you don't want to <laughs> respond to that in that time. So um, then we'll leave it up to the legal guys. And especially if there's a big firm behind, the legal department is quite eager to take this as a huge example that you're not going to hack us. And meanwhile, the manager who's irresponsible just sits back and thinks, well, this will fade away. That's the moment when the hackers call a journalist. Because they truly believe that these vulnerabilities need to be brought into the open. Not to bug them, but to pre prevent further harm. And believe me, journalists love these stories. And if you, even though you're saying, well, don't mention names, don't make it too big, they will, because they need a juicy story, hard, cut, and short. Be aware of these guys. Some of the hackers come to me, say, well, you're writing a book, so we have more time, you, know, you have more text to say what actually happened, and not just a headline that the site sucks, right? That's the advantage of doing a book. Still, there are some cases who are nearly perfect. Let's take Marktplatz, which is a daughter of eBay. People trade stuff over there, you log in, you have credentials, money goes around, so it's great for hacking, you know, if you've got this user word passing, then you can go in there, you have fake transactions. So these guys are really secure, you know. Uh, last year, we had a presentation of Marktplatz. Uh, they do a red team, uh, blue team sessions. They call it beer and pizza try to hack each other, so they're, they're pretty much aware of security. Then this guy came in, Peter Flasbom, or Lego Steentje. Uh, 19 years old, uh, being in high school, being very bored with his education because it's not really challenging, but then again, he got this traineeship where he needed to make automatic ads. When he did it at Marktplatz, he found out that in one of the text box, you could put JavaScript, cross-site scripting, you know, easy as it. And he was quite surprised that he could put his own software in there so you can have the site behave as your site, launch people to malware or do fake advertisement, all that kind of stuff. Well, that couldn't be possible in Markov, right? So he put a small text on Twitter saying, found a little security problem on Markplans. Was Annefeld saw it. In a couple of hours, he responded, said, will we have responsible disclosure procedure? Gave him a link. And these bullets actually quite resemble the responsible disclosure guideline. Uh, putting it even stronger, some people say that the responsible disclosure guidelines were got from eBay. Not that they bought them, but they copied a bit. Well, that's also under debate. But these guys are pretty security aware and said, well, just email some of your proof, we'll get in a discussion, and it was quite nice. And they said, well, you know, you're a bit bored, right, at your traineeship. And he said, well, yeah. So he came over to Marktplatz to work over there. Even better, he got a job. So now the stuff he has been doing, cross-site scripting, SKL injection, all the basic stuff he now performs on all the eBay sites. It's about your age, and you got a good job without having the proper education. Well, that's cool, right? Uh, yet another nearly perfect case. Blasty, Stephen Kettler, and the 10 million modems. 
or I hacked KPN and I got one of these t-shirts. This is Stefan and Peter at Hack in the Box. Uh, what they are doing there, they have this laboratory setting with the Zeitzel modem, a couple of phones, and their laptop. What they're doing is that they're eavesdropping on the communication of the modem. They're spying on the communication. They're actually showing the audience how to do it. Is this responsible? Well, KPN thought so, because during the presentation, JJ Ballou, the chief information security officer, runs on the stage and gave them the T-shirt. Oh, you were there too, right? Yeah, okay. Recognize your face, but... And uh, they said, well, thank you for hacking our network. And she shouts, responsible Scotia works. Well, that's my, the, the beautiful gratitude you can get. Well, what happened? These two guys were sitting at home, and they had a modem, playing around, being bored, trying stuff. And they said, they were, so there was a help page with a little text box. Put in some random code, nothing happened. But they discovered if you put in more than 58 signs, it crashes. And from the crash report, they could see how the thing worked. Then, then they started to put in software and found the back door. The management port, uh, 7676, don't know if anyone says that's only about port 7676 of the Zyxel modem, is used by the phone company as a sort of back end to install new software, to do updates. And if you can go in there, you can install anything you like. So in the beginning, they just turn the screen around, put other pictures in it, fun stuff, but also spyware. This is getting frightening because Zyxel modem is being used by tens of million people around the world. And these two guys, 18 and 19 year old, found this problem. So they were a bit anxious to report this. They thought, yeah, well, what could we do? So they sent an encrypted email to the third team of KPN. We found a security problem, but we're afraid we, uh, you are going to sue us. That, that was their text. At KPN, Martijn van der Heijden, uh, some, uh, someone from the team, works there for quite a long time. Um, when I talked to him, he said, well, yes, when I got this email, I immediately responded because these guys were helping us. But six years ago, things were rather different at KPN. Then I would go immediately to the legal department, and they, these guys love this. Martin stood up and stood in between, and since then, they had a very good responsible disclosure procedure. Even stronger, these guys were invited to KPN to give their presentation over there. And Martin was actually very in impressed by the proof they gave on how they hacked the Zyxel modem. Again, they negotiated the term, a couple of weeks, two months, to fix the problem, and they could go to Hack in the Box to give their presentation, as they did. So when I interviewed these two guys, they were, the, they were all quite happy, you know. This is responsible disclosure, but one thing bothered me. You know, you went to KPM, but there are so many other people using the Zyxel modem, and you hacked the management port. So if you're telling how to do this, other people will do that too. And if you hack the management port, the telecom company cannot reset it. So actually you set something loose, which you can't repair. There's debate about that too. But let's not go into that now. So this brings you to another problem of, of responsible disclosure. It's a whole change of insecurity. You know, things are connected and it's not one owner. Um, in the last presentation, you saw that the telcos, they uh, went to responsible disclosure together. The, 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 the big ones are pretty well organized on responsible disclosure. But then, again, the cheaper ones, they just don't bother. Super goedkoop aanbieding, which means super sales, very, very cheap. Well, this is actually a very cheap phone company, your phone. It's the cheapest one. Um, anyway, here we have Jeroen van der Ham. He's a teacher and researcher at the University of Amsterdam. Uh, he teaches about 35 young guys how to hack, but do it in a responsible way, and all sorts of security stuff he learns through them. And he has a subscription at Uphone. His girlfriend, too. She forgot her password, and she couldn't get in here anymore. And he said, well, you don't, could you have a look at this? He tried to reset her password, but it didn't work. So that's odd. So he tried his own password to reset it. And he was quite surprised on what happened. He filled in an email address. It wasn't verified, so he could fill in any email address. There were no secure cookies, so they couldn't log who was going in there. Um, and worst of all, he got a password, which was his postal code and the number of his house. Well, you can imagine that somebody like that faces much more severe security problems, but this is really odd if a phone company does something stupid like this. 
So the first thing he did, he was, he sent an email to the help desk. Guess what happened? No response. He called them and said, oh, no, no, no problem. Okay. Then he put it on Twitter, and the phone company said, well, there's no problem at all, you go ahead. And I thought, well, this can't be true, you know, because if you can reset somebody's password, you can give them new subscriptions, you can download all their phone calls, so why is this stupid company not responding to it? Then he called the NCSC. It wasn't a weekend, so in the weekend, the NCC search team only does the very severe cases, so it took a little while, but Monday, they responded. And um, they gave him the email address of the secretary of the director. So he sent an email again, but in the meanwhile, this director heard that the National Cyber Security Center called, that there was something wrong with his website. Well, then he did respond, and he called Jeroen himself. He said, well, what you can actually do with this problem, and so he explained it, and it was fixed. They didn't mention it to Jeroen, by the way, that it was fixed. They didn't even thank him for all the effort he did. But he did get him a t-shirt from the National Cyber Security Center. <laughs> that was nice. And he was quite, quite pride, proud of wearing the t-shirt. Uh, that's how we met, actually, because I saw him wearing the t-shirt. Oh, no, where did you get this t-shirt? And he told the story. But, well, that's a nice story for my research, you know? That's how <laughs> things go. OK. Now the more heavy stuff, because this is, this is the low-hanging fruit, right? This is stuff you, 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 most of you guys know, and you know, it can go wrong, can go right, but it's always the human factor. Now the more heavy stuff, cryptologists. Uh, actually, th these are some of my heroes. Uh, Roel Verduld, uh, Wouter Tepe, and of course, Bart Jacobs. Uh, for the international people, this is one of the big security professors who always reaches the news if something goes wrong, Bart Jacobs. Uh, I met him in 2004, and then he was just beginning to, to <coughs> setting his research group up, and it's now 40 members. And they mainly focus on RFID chips. Uh, I don't know if you know what RFID chips are, but with radio frequency uh, identification, you can communicate with the chip, uh, so it doesn't need a power battery or something like that. So they put them in smart cards, you can, well, get quite a lot of code in, so for payment, access systems, uh, they use RFID all over the world, billions of chips. And one which was used by then was the MyFair Classic. And it's a classic example indeed, used by a million applications throughout the world for accessing building, but also for transport cards. If you come from another country, most cities have these electronic uh, transport cards. For the Netherlands, we now implement the one nationwide for all modalities. A big, huge project with so many people involved, you don't know who's in charge anymore. So therefore, this might be a nice target. Um, what did they do? Well, in short, the technical stuff. If you check in with this card, it doesn't just say, well, it's card number this or that. It first authenticates, I'm a real card, and the reader says, well, I'm a real reader, and some information goes back and forth. The card gives a random number, which is being calculated by an algorithm and being sent back and forth, and then they really communicate. Quite secure, would think. Uh, especially if you get a lot of random numbers being generated. But the thing is, the crypto behind it, the algorithm which uh, uses the key, was hidden. Security by obscurity, they call it. So if you find the algorithm, you can hack them all. And these guys, from an academic point of view, but also from a security point of view, they don't like security by obscurity. You know, the algorithm should be published so everybody can try it out, and the key should be the complex thing. That's the one you need to hack. And if you do, if you have so much time to find the right key, then you only broken one, and not the whole system. But they did. It took them a year time. But once they did, they also found out that these cards are also being used to access important buildings, defense, ministries, offices, this is a national problem. So the first informed the Ministry of Internal Affairs. Security services came in, saw what they did. Yeah, they actually hacked it, they did. Then they informed the transport companies and the manufacturer, NXP, which is from Philips. This company, uh, NXP, first responded quite positively. Well, you've done so much work, you guys. Great, you can help us improve our crypto, if you please sign this non-disclosure agreement, please. 
oh, if you're an academic, you're not going to do that. You want to go out. Well, in fact, in half a year, they were going to ACDX conference, and they wanted to write their paper on how they hacked the MyFair Classic. Well, actually, they, they don't want to call it hacking, but they found vulnerabilities. Well, I call it hacking. Uh, NXP was a bit upset about that. Half a year. Guys, we got billions of chips lying all over the world. It will take us two years to migrate. So what did they do? Took them to court. So where this very friendly company of NXP first sought collaboration, sent a letter to Bud Jacobs personally, that if they would proceed with publishing this information, they would sue him and the university for a million euros. It's quite a lot for a small piece of text. Well, what were their legal arguments? And I think this is interesting for other cases too, because this is the legal toolbox people take if you want to uh, keep hackers from uh, publishing your information. Um, first, they said uh, secrecy. You know, this, this is confidential information. You can't just spread this around. Second, they said, it's a copyright issue. It's intellectual property. Well, that argument, didn't really work, but they tried it in court, because uh, when something is intellectual property, uh, it can be protected, but it needs to have some creativity in it, and it needs to be an original creator, like a writer or an artist. So there was this guy who was responsible for developing the crypto. Uh, they gave him a sort of presentation. Uh, to demand that this was actually intellectual property. So can you imagine that there's a, there's a calculation, an algebraic formula, and, and this, this guy who developed it in the 90s, being brought to court to say it's art? Well, that didn't really work. Now it's getting serious. The third argument they use, and this is being used more often in responsible disclosure, is that the freedom of speech comes with certain responsibilities. You can't say everything because if you say something which harms the society as a whole, a judge can stop you from saying this. It can be discriminatory, you can uh, create hate. And if they would set this loose, then society will be a danger. So that was what it was all about. The judge decided that it was actually in the benefit of society that this information would be brought out. And I believe that this case, which ended in 2008, uh, is a very important case law. It said jurisprudence on responsible disclosure. That if you disclose in a responsible way, that the owner of the system is responsible for societal harm, and not the hacker. You might think case closed, because this was 2008. Then the same guys took another target, expensive cars. Volkswagen, uh, the high-level cars, Lamborghini, Porsche, those guys. Um, and they have electronic keys in them, you know, so you can't just pull out the wires and start the car, you know, like in the movies. And there's an RVD chip in it too. And again, the researchers started working on the crypto, reverse engineering, input, output, and found the algorithm behind it. Again, they took six months for writing their paper, informed all organizations involved, which was Thales, who developed the algorithm, EM, who was the chip manufacturer who used, used it, and some other people too. To their surprise, they were called to court by Volkswagen. Volkswagen? One of the users. He's not the owner of the algorithm, but they used the same arguments as in the previous case. Confidentiality, authorship of intellectual property, and freedom of speech can be bound if there's a societal need to it. There was only one big difference. They took it to England. And there the law works slightly different. There the societal need is being more vaguely defined. And they found a judge who said, yes, actually these guys are helping criminals to steal millions of cars. So you can't publish this article, and if you do, you get a huge fine. Is this just about two articles and two judges? No. This is about two legal systems where responsible disclosure might work very differently in the Netherlands than in England. So if you're a hacker, do it in the Netherlands. If you're a company, take the lawsuit to England. That's my advice to you. 
So here's what the judge, well, all the, all the, also the website of the judges looks a bit more old fashioned. If, if, if you read this stuff, it's, it's quite funny how he tries to explain how the system works. He says, well, when the key is happy, the lock is happy, dot, 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 he really doesn't understand. And about responsible disclosure, he literally says, there is no such thing. These guys are just going their way and having this as a sort of argument afterwards. Don't go to England if you're an hacker. There are other people who don't wait that long and don't take procedures. Uh, anyone recognizing? Oh, sorry, yeah, let's skip the slide. So, so what do, do cryptologists do when they can't publish? They publish this. It's the hash function of their article. And they still couldn't publish it, but if it gets published somewhere in the future, this code is saying that they first found how they could crack the, the algorithm. Okay, what I was saying is, anybody recognize this sign? This tweet? Yeah, somebody laughing? Somebody know? Yeah, over there, okay. These are IP addresses of SCADA systems. Well, we've had a lot of lectures about SCADA systems, industrial control systems, water pumps, traffic lights, uh, all sorts of heavy stuff being managed from a distance by a line. And there are some uh, who don't have any passwords. So Antisec, which is the name of this anonymous hacker, found a couple of these uh, machines online, called some of the people, warned them, but they wouldn't listen, so he went full disclosure. Can get you some great friends. Um, does anybody know who Saba is? Suba? Sabu? Yeah, yeah, okay, you know, yeah, yeah. It's one of the main charities in We Are Anonymous. Uh, he led most of the hacks, uh, but currently he has some new friends. He went over to the other side, the FBI, and they asked him to bring up some of these SCADA systems to be hacked. So um, you can imagine that something, somebody like that would like to remain anonymous. Even though he was trying to achieve a proper goal, he was doing it quite roughly. The NCSC immediately got into contact with him through Pacebit and Twitter, all sorts of anonymous uh, communication channels to sort this out. It was quite difficult to communicate with him. So then you need people like this. He was asking questions at the last session. This is Oscar Kuro. He too saw the IP addresses coming uh, by and he therefore thought, well, we uh, might uh, do something about it. So he called other people from CERT teams. They tested some stuff and he found one pump uh, in Vera was literally nakedly online and he brought it to the media. Thing is with media, they need images. So they were in contact with Antisec Tube, yeah, but somebody who is anonymous, you don't have a nice item. So therefore, Oscar stepped in and actually took the credits for this. But he acknowledges that Antisec was there first, even though he did it a bit clumsy. And he was downstairs yesterday to, to tell this story, so I think I'll stop here with uh, SCADA systems. You can watch it back on YouTube. So finally, um, this morning we did a responsible disclosure at the conference itself. Uh, the University of Groningen was quite severely hacked in 2007. Uh, in the newspaper you could read they had a 100,000 euros fine uh, uh, damage. Uh, malware was installed, 250 computers were compromised, they had to clean up the whole stuff. But it was one guy, Frank Brocken, who is the security manager over there, he said, well, actually it was a wake-up call for us. And we learned something of it. But the guy who done it, and I met him, uh, we now call him uh, Access for Me to All. It's a, just a name we made up together, but his whole experience are up there on Twitter, on what he did in Dutch. So this morning we had an interview to explain him this stuff. Because even though it was a long time ago, and he didn't get caught. Back then he was still young, just playing around, learning tricks, how to hack stuff. And he didn't know that the damage was so severe. And he felt guilty, remorse, he wanted to come out. So I negotiated between the two. I sent Frank Brocken an email, remember 2007? Yes, he did. I know who did it. Oh, he was quite curious. Can we meet him? I, I can give him a cup of coffee. And I said, well, first you need to promise me you won't prosecute him. He sent me an email, no, I won't prosecute him, he can get a cup of coffee and it will sign with PGP. 
I didn't know what pretty good privacy meant by then, but for the hacker, this would suffice as a proof. So this morning, down at the Tech Talk studio, the two of them met. And the guy had, had some great stories about how he did it. You know, he went uh, online, just searching all sorts of university websites, and he first found the print server. He could get in because the passwords weren't hashed, and he had a rainbow table, could get in there. What was more, they were using the same password for all sorts of machines. And he found the install server, and there he installed his own software, so every computer who was logging in for the updates contaminated itself. And within a couple of weeks, he had access to the whole university, control over every computer there. And he was bragging about it on Computer for other hackers, you know, the cool stuff. And he said, well, we don't believe you. We need proof. Here, here's a, here's a movie. Put this on the server. And he did. He did some other fun stuff, too. Uh, there was a wake-up LAN function, so he could switch on all the computers at night. Imagine you're a cleaner and just all the computers, they start up. It's kind of odd. So they met this morning. And if you want to know how it went, you can watch the video this Friday, because they're not here. They wanted to remain anonymous up until this point, and it's also a teaser to drag you to our YouTube channel. <laughs> so, OK, now I have to come to conclusions. Um, according to my record, I have 33 minutes spent, but I had a little bit time short uh, because of the last one. But these are my conclusions. Um, actually, I can't summarize it in bullets, you know. Okay, you have to read the manual. Responsible disclosure guidelines, they do work. It's important. It's a way to settle a negotiation. But perhaps what we need more is good storytelling on how actually these revelations happen in practice. Because it just isn't one system manager and one hacker who interact and get into a fight. It's a whole bunch of people with different needs in different contexts, which you need to understand. And the more storytelling we have, the more we see this chain of insecurities of people holding on to their own positions who don't want to talk to each other, and maybe we can change it to a web of trust. That if it's a hacker who found vulnerabilities and he uh, disclosed in a responsible way in the past, they know him and you can trust them. And please do report to these guys if you get this vulnerability reports because it's important to them. And if you don't report, they'll go to the press. To the hackers, I have to say, have a little bit of patience. Some of them, they report and they think that it's immediately fixed. Some think that three weeks will do. Others think, well, well a half a year will do. Well, it's somewhere in between. And if they understand the world of the system administrator a little bit more that he has to cope with many problems every day, that he's got a tight budget, that will also help. Finally, you can help me. As I said in the beginning, the book is on Creative Commons, so it's just open, anybody can use it, no copyright. Uh, all my chapters I put online. So on this URL, cvth, that's my name, dot nl, the Netherlands, slash vo, verantwoorde onthullingen, that's the Dutch phrase for responsible disclosure. Yes, it will be in English too, later on. Please respond. Then I can use it in my book, which will come out this fall or winter. So I assume we don't have much time for discussion now, but if you want any discussion on responsible disclosure or say anything you like at this conference, please come down and join me in the Tech Talk studio. Thank you very much. Is there time for questions or not? Uh, I think we can take uh, questions. Okay. You can switch the camera off now so everybody's free to say uh, what they like. <laughs>